My name is Sean Kavanagh and I'm a final year PhD student in the groups of David Scanlon at University College London and Aaron Walsh at Imperial College London. And my research uses modeling techniques to understand and optimize solid state solar cell materials, looking at bulk properties as well as more material specific behavior, such as defects and disorder. Today, I'm gonna to speak about some of our recent work looking at the impact of cation disorder on solar cell performance in the emerging class of ABZ2 calcogenide materials, which are promising candidates in the field of low cost, non-toxic and stable solar cells. So given the many advantages of perovskites, which I'm sure everyone is well aware of, but also the well-known stability and toxicity concerns, researchers have looked to understand the key performant properties of the perovskites um, to then try and identify alternative materials with similar properties and hopefully thus performance while avoiding the presence of lead and achieving a good level of operational stability. In particular, the rapid improvement in efficiency of perovskites in such a short time span gives us hope that we can learn from their success and adopt a materials by design approach to identify these so-called perovskite inspired materials. So in this field, one of the first materials design approaches used, and in fact, probably one of the oldest tuning techniques in the chemist's toolbox was that of atomic substitution. So here we retain the perovskite crystal structure, but uh, employ ionic substitution to replace our divalent B-site cation, i.e. lead, um, for a chemically similar species to avoid this presence of lead. So initially, these materials seemed quite promising. However, a consequence of this cation substitution, which has become clearer with more research on these materials over the last few years, is that it leads to a significant reduction in the electronic dimensionality of these materials. So by this, we mean essentially the mobilities of electrons and holes uh, in the material. And for example, in this, say, vacancy ordered perovskite, you can see that uh, we have these isolated octahedra and effectively a zero dimensional crystal structure, which gives low carrier mobilities or dimensionality. So reduced electronic dimensionality often favors carrier localization and trapping, which severely impedes solar cell performance and contributing to the relatively low efficiencies achieved thus far. So this brings me to the alternative class of perovskite inspired material that I'm going to be focusing on in this presentation, uh, with which we can hope to overcome these issues of electronic dimensionality, and which has experienced quite a dramatic rise in research interest in the last couple of years. So these are the disordered ABZ2 materials, where A and B are uh, cations and Z is a calcogen anion like sulfur or selenium. They have this rock salt crystal structure, but with a disordered 50-50 occupancy of our cation site by the A and B cations. And a key chemical similarity with conventional perovskites is the presence of this MX6 octahedral motif, but with a key difference being the closer packing of the octahedra. So no longer having that A site spacer ion uh, like cesium that we have in conventional perovskites, but now having both edge and corner sharing octahedra. So this close packing and high dimensionality uh, in combination with disorder on the cation sublattice is actually one of the key benefits of this material class over those other perovskite inspired materials I mentioned, where we now have a pseudo direct band gap with a low and ideal energy for solar absorption and low carrier masses. So in the studies I'll talk about today, we sought to understand the impact of this disorder on the cation sublattice and to then leverage these insights to optimize the photovoltaic performance. In general, modeling atomic disorder presents a real challenge for theoretical methods, which prefer to deal with high symmetry ground state materials. Here, we employed a range of computational approaches to achieve a well-rounded picture of disorder in these materials, including the popular special quasi-random structure approach in which you generate a supercell with the cations arranged quasi-randomly such that the radial correlation functions match that of an infinite perfectly random arrangement. So this typically provides a good approximation of the fully disordered material at a reasonable computational cost. In addition, we employed a structural enumeration approach to look at the behavior and impact of cation correlations or clustering in these materials, where we enumerated all possible symmetry inequivalent cation arrangements within a 32 atom supercell and calculated their structural, energetic and optical properties to correlate these trends uh, in behavior with the photovoltaic performance. In the first of these studies, we worked on the silver bismuth sulfide member of this family. 
Our key finding was that optical absorption was greatly reduced when we get this clustering of cations in the material, with an absorption coefficient approximately two times greater when we have a uh, homogeneous near random disorder instead. I don't have time to go into details here, but with accurate calculations of the electronic structure for various cation configurations in the material, we showed that this was essentially due to a spatial separation of our valence band maximum and conduction band minimum in the clustered material, reducing the transition dipole moment and thus the optical absorption. The issue is that we expect our as synthesized nanocrystals to have significant presence of these cation clusters due to the rapid hot injection synthesis methods employed, as well as surface ligand interactions, which are known to favor cation segregation in these materials. So as such, our collaborators in Barcelona applied low temperature annealing treatments to the as synthesized nanocrystals to try and induce this entropically driven shift toward a more homogeneous cation distribution. In doing so, they found the same absorption enhancements that we had calculated with a doubling of the absorption coefficient across the visible range. With this absorption enhancement, we actually obtained a material with an absorption coefficient higher than any other solar material currently being studied, which was really exciting. To confirm it was indeed this shift from an inhomogeneous to homogeneous cation distribution in the nanocrystals that was driving this absorption enhancement, we compared our calculated and experimental changes under X-ray diffraction, XPS, and TEM line scans to give us confidence in our model of the underlying atomic behavior at play. So these absorption enhancements allowed us to develop record-breaking solar cells, yielding devices with over 9% efficiency in an ultra-thin architecture, demonstrating the exciting potential that this disorder engineering approach has as a powerful materials design tool. Two other records held by this material are that it has the highest absorption coefficient of any currently studied photovoltaic material and the highest efficiency of any bismuth-based solar material, uh, which have been heavily investigated over the last decade as lead-free alternative solar cell materials. Okay, so how do you further your understanding of the dominant chemistry in a material class? Well, a time-tested classic is to change something and see what happens, see if it matches your expectations. So with this in mind, we went on to look at the sodium isomorph of this class. And initially, we find similar promising properties, such as extremely strong optical absorption in the visible range, which is reflected in the high theoretical efficiency for an ultra-thin solar cell here. So these ultra-thin solar cells are quite a hot topic in the field at the moment, as they have a lot of exciting alternative applications that silicon cannot fulfill, for example, in non-invasive flexible solar cells for wireless indoor power or wearable electronics, or another major application is in space uh, where power to weight ratios are extremely important. However, our calculations consistently showed the emergence of these localized states in the electronic band gap of this material, um, which we did not see with the silver isomorph. So by acting as uh, stepping stones across the electronic band gap, these localized states are expected to lead to carrier trapping and recombination and thus are severely detrimental to solar cell performance. So why, despite the equal oxidation states of sodium and silver, do we get such different bonding behavior in these two materials? Well, with silver, we have this filled D10 valence subshell, which gives us a strong antibonding contribution at the valence band maximum, whereas the sodium cation has an empty noble gas type valence shell and so behaves effectively as a spectator ion with no covalent interaction with the anion P states. So this gives us a low energy non-bonding type VBM uh, in this sodium based material, which then allows the emergence of these localized states in the electronic band gap of the material um, at sodium rich pockets whereas the higher VBM in the silver-based material effectively screens out these localized states and avoids their effects. As expected, these localized electronic states lead to ultra-fast carrier trapping followed by extremely slow decay, overall killing solar cell performance in this material as expected. Okay, so this mechanism I mentioned where the electronic structure of silver bismuth sulfide makes it far more tolerant to these localized states is actually the same mechanism as one of the most uh, accepted contributing factors to defect tolerance in perovskites, where the same antibonding type interaction at the valence band maximum increases the VBM energy and makes the localized states associated with defects become shallow in the band gap, i.e. pushing them closer uh, to the band edge, 
thus making them benign when it comes to trapping and recombination. Defect tolerance is essentially the magic behind perovskites as it allows them to achieve high efficiencies despite cheap solution growth. So I believe this serves as an important example of how the underlying orbital chemistry of the material will dictate how disorder or indeed defects will affect the electronic properties of the material. So before I finish, I'd like to pose a general question brought up from these works and other recent reports in the field, which is, is disorder universally bad for solar cell performance? Conventionally, it's always been something as material scientists that we've tried to avoid, as we know it kills performance in conventional materials like silicon, cadmium telluride, gallium arsenide. However, the top performing lead halide perovskites these days are mixed triple cation, triple anion compounds with a huge amount of compositional disorder at various length scales. As I mentioned here, the best performing bismuth based uh, PV materials is this disordered silver bismuth sulfide, despite being a relative newcomer in the field. So I think these results and other recent reports show that disorder is not necessarily universally bad and not just black and white, but rather the nature of this disorder and its impact on the electronic properties are of key importance. In particular, it seems that certain materials can exhibit a certain disorder tolerance analogous to defect tolerance, and with greater understanding of this phenomenon, we could potentially tame disorder as a powerful tool for our materials design toolkit, opening up the possibility of fine tuning performance across a range of applications, um, not just photovoltaics, but beyond with thermoelectrics or LEDs, for example. So the main conclusions to take from these works are that disorder presents a powerful tool to tune materials properties and optimize performance. However, we show that both the nature and the distribution of this disorder, as well as the underlying orbital chemistry, are key considerations for the intelligent design of emerging photovoltaic materials. To finish, I'd like to thank my supervisors, Professors Aaron Walsh and David Scanlon, our collaborators across Europe, and you for your attention. Thank you.